about half of those infested trees because the surveys only find about half in total, at least with the way we did the survey. Because the pink area on the uh, map in the center, there wasn't, we didn't do extensive surveys in there because we knew that was generally infested. Um, most of the trees were ornamental street trees, so we didn't have a lot of woodlots or ravines to worry about, which made it would have been a lot more difficult operationally. Did have a few, but we treated each one independently and started on the edge and, and stopped cutting once we didn't find any more infested trees. Aggressive, you have to be aggressive on these to be successful. Um, as I mentioned, the insect was discovered in September and trees are being cut by November. Um, it's kind of ruthless. You have to cut down trees. These are trees in people's yards, front yards, backyards, ornamentals, and street trees, but you had to cut those trees. We cut and chipped them instead of using the insecticide, which was done in the US to make sure we got all the infested trees. And then grind the stumps to make sure that anything that was living in the stump or on the root flare would be um, destroyed. And making sure that people didn't go and replant host species in that, in that regulated area until the infestation was eradicated. And I mentioned the buffer zone of 400 meters in 2003 and then 800 meters in 2013. So there were operational challenges doing this in the winter time, doing surveys, um, having to climb trees, all kinds of operational challenges, but they were overcome by crews of dedicated uh, professional workers. And this is another slide of some of the work being done to cut down those trees, chip them and, and uh, eliminate the insect. At the same time, the CFA was carrying out its own surveys to make sure there wasn't an infestation somewhere else. So this is what was going on in Ontario from uh, 2008 to 2012 with on a rotating basis going through various areas and this was repeated uh, in other locations in Canada to see if the insect might be arriving might have established somewhere else you have to be sustained you have to keep at this when you tell your bosses that this is a, about a 10-year timeline to be successful that scares them sometimes but that is the truth for a forest insect a 10-year eradication program is not out of the realm of possibilities um, we had to regroup in 2013 and say, oh, we, we were worried that we didn't get it all. When, when the announcement was made in 2013 that it was eradicated, the part of the messaging was it could have been moved somewhere else or it could have established somewhere else. So stay vi vigilant. And true, that turned out to be true because it was found later that same year and the program was restarted. Um, the map on the right shows the surveys that were done outside the, um, the general infested area of the 20, 2003 infestation showing all the surveys that were needed over many years to find, make sure that there were no more infested trees. So continually surveying, cutting trees as they were found, you have to keep this up. And you have to keep updating the bosses and the public, keep them interested in, and keep them engaged. And you have to keep your operation staff engaged because after a while, this becomes hard work. When the emergency, the urgency is over, you have to keep them engaged. We had six federal elections during this period, and we had three majority governments and three minority governments federally. You have you change ministers, you change governments, and you have to keep the program going. That takes a lot of political acuity on the senior levels of the organizations, particularly the CFIA and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, to make sure that they stays as a priority. Um, you have to maintain interest of your surveyors because you know, so many zeros, I'm not finding the insect. Well, what do you do? They get bored after a while, they lose their sharpness. So one of the things that was done was that trees were, were marked with uh, artificial exit holes or egg laying pits. And when those were found by a surveyor, then they got just as much reward out of that as finding an actually infested one. And that also gave us an idea of how accurate the surveys were. Um, then we had to be sustained and when it was found in, in, 2000 in, th in 2013, just outside, about eight to 10 kilometers from the nearest infested tree of the original area. Now you have to regroup and get everybody interested again to keep this up. And start the surveys and find out where it is and, and start this whole program all over again. Thankfully, we knew what to do, so it wasn't like we had to reinvent things. The other part of this is transparent, collaborative, and science-based. So by transparent, a lot of that is communications. You have to tell people what you're doing. You need to have your social license. You have to communicate upwards in your organizations and make sure the senior levels understand what's going on. You have to communicate downwards to the operation staff, the people who are implementing it. 
and you have to communicate outwards to the public and engage them in all the things that you're doing. Um, the picture at the bottom right where it says media tree, that's a picture of, of a tree that was one of the last ones to be cut. It had over position pits, egg laying pits and exit holes that people could see and you could take people to and show them what this insect looks like. Um, Amid uncertainties, when you're doing one of these things, everybody has worries that you may not have, you may not know everything that you need to know. But when you admit those up front, and when you say to people, yeah, we don't know exactly how far this insect flies, but we think you'll get 99% of them if your cutting zone is 400 meters. And you admit that you don't know it all, but you give them your best scientific interpretation of the data, then they, they're much more accepting of your plan. So things that you know you don't know and things that you don't know you don't know and you have to be able to admit to all of those. You are still developing a technical plan. There's, it's based on imperfect information and an incomplete understanding of the situation. Um, and that's then going to someone in the organization that has to make a political based, politically based decision, an operationally based decision. So when we say, well, it should be 400 meters or it should be 800 meters, uh, then somebody has to interpret that and decide whether or not that's what they want to do because in the case of science-based uh, plans, science is only one consideration in the actual decision. There's budgets, there's political acceptance, public acceptance, uh, and other things to consider for the uh, before a decision is made. But one of the things that we do is we design the research program, we design it around those uncertainties. So if they say, well, uh, how far does it fly? Well, we work with say our colleagues in China to say, how far does this thing fly? And, and then we use that to continually inform and update and adapt the operational plan. So you back it up by research that, to reduce your uncertainty. You need to be transparent and to keep your social license up. When you're cutting a park like this one, Wildwood Park, then you need to make sure that people are behind you. Uh, that's a lot of outreach, education, awareness, something that uh, a lot of our partners were involved in. Um, and that was a key part of our success. We're lucky that we have a macro photogenic enemy, and I think that's a term from Bruce Gill at the CFIA, that we have an insect that takes good pictures. Uh, it's not a fungus on a petri dish. It's something that takes big scary pictures and, and has remarkable coloration and large size, and so people take notice. It's a threat to things that people care about. To, it's a threat to Canada's national symbol. Uh, to maples and to our, our flag uh, with the maple leaf on it. And it's a threat to maple syrup. So Ontario is concerned about that, Quebec is concerned, and the U.S. is concerned. They want to make sure we are successful keeping this insect from getting out of Toronto, Vaughan, and Mississauga into the hinterland. And it also helped to have some community champions, people that, like a particular city councillor, uh, people on the news, people that were concerned about this, that were behind the effort saying, yes, this is a drastic thing that needs to be done, but it does need to be done. Collaboration was a big part of our success, and you'll be hearing some of that, of that more of that. Um, we need to be collaborative to engage the public. They are an important part of this, and as I mentioned, the um, infestation, the two fines were made by uh, people from the public. Um, there is a lot of federal, provincial, municipal agencies involved and you have the Canadian Food Inspection Agency as the lead, but you have many other agencies involved in making sure this is successful. And when you have three different, um, uh, three different municipalities and two different regional governments involved, uh, then you have a lot of layers of government to, um, to keep involved, keep them engaged, and, and to have their support. Um, it's important to take care of the politics between the Ontario and federal government. There was something called the Canadian sorry, the Critical Plant Pest Management Committee, which is a group of directors of the natural resource-based uh, departments and ministries that met on a regular basis. And that made sure that the two levels of government were supporting each other. They weren't going into the press and complaining or con contradicting or asking or pressuring. It took the politics out by ensuring there was good communications between those two levels of government, between the federal and provincial government. We had lots of support from the U.S. We had expertise on the science panel from the U.S. that were advising us and sharing their expertise and, uh, as one, and what was going on in the U.S. for their eradication programs. And we divide up the responsibility based on what people were good at or what agencies were good at. Toronto had a good program for uh, its inventory. Toronto had a good program for its 
um, tree removal maintenance program and for contracting out. So, you know, that was the good place to go to to make sure that they oversaw the actual operations because they were already well set up to do that. And we coordinated communications and, produ and we produced common messaging. So the signage, the fact sheets, um, the talking to the press, those were coordinated and shared so that we're all, um, we we're still independent enough to represent our own agencies, but we also weren't making it worse by contradicting or playing politics in the press. Several of those agencies are pictured here, City of Toronto, Mississauga, uh, Canadian Forest Service, Ontario Minister of Natural Resources, Toronto Region Conservation Authority, York Region, the USDA uh, Department of Agriculture, including the Forest Service, um, Agriculture Research Service, and Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, and, and the City of Vaughan. So all those played a big part in this program. Um, so these are some of the pictures of some of those people that were uh, sharing in this. And I'll draw your attention to the, the cartoon on the, uh, uh, on the bottom right. Um, that was produced by the Invasive Plant Council. And I put this in to remind me that there are lots of people involved that aren't front and center, but are doing things that are supportive, all kinds of outreach and communication programs that were very um, helpful and contributing to the success overall, because it's insect could be found anywhere. Science Advisory Panel, this was a key part of it. They were the ones that developed the, the program and it was an independent panel led by Jean Turgeon of the Canadian Forest Service. So it had representatives from various agencies, including Toronto, Natural Resources, York Region, University of Toronto, um, Vaughan and, uh, the Animal, and the USDA Forest Service and so on. So lots of support on that science panel to answer the questions. They designed the eradication program and provided that plan to the CFIA. They designed the surveys and present, provided that. They answered specific questions that CFI would put to them on various things, um, literature review, data needs, but and more importantly, they had access to the unwritten information that was coming out of the US or elsewhere in Canada or China on what we need to know about this insect. So you needed a, a, a science panel that was networked into, um, into other experts outside. They developed the criteria for eradication. What, how do you know when it, you've been successful in eradicating this insect? And as I said, it was independent of the, C, of the CFA, provided advice for the CFI to interpret and use as it needed. Some of the questions, basic things, how far does it fly? Are insecticides effective? If you're going to chip, how do you chip? What's what size? Um, what temperature for composting? What do you do about stumps? Those kinds of things. Uh, another series of questions, does it have a two-year life cycle? Um, how long does a surveyor look at a tree? How fast is it spreading? In what direction is it spreading? What do you do about woodlots and ravines? Um, is there a lure or a trap for it? What are the host preferences? Where did that 2013 infestation come from? Those are all science questions that had to be answered. And these are some of the people that were doing that. Every tree that was cut down was examined on the ground. If it was infested, it was brought back to the lab and dendrochronology was done to determine answers to some of those questions. So um, getting to the end here, uh, what were some of the ingredients of success? What are the take home messages? Well, rapid, aggressive, sustained response. We covered that. Transparent, collaborative, science-based. Some of the other key ingredients, early detection. It was found early and it's a relatively slow moving insect that doesn't usually go a long ways. We had a reliable survey method, even though it wasn't 100%, it was pretty darn good. We had tree climbers, bucket trucks and ground surveys, and they found a lot of the infested trees. So once you found it, you knew the insect was relatively close by. Uh, we had an effective control method, cutting and chipping. There's no more infested tree once you've cut and chipped it. And we had a 10 year plus commitment. The organizations involved were committed to success. The multi-agency response. This is too big a problem for one agency to do on its own, and that was seen up front, emitted up front, and everybody saw that it was in everybody's best interest to work together to collaborate on this. Uh, the science panel was very effective and independent, and I'm a bit biased on that, but hey. Um, and there was research done to reduce the uncertainties all along uh, every step of the way. And then one of the more important points can't be overlooked, and that's why these pictures are here, is we had a group of dedicated, competent staff, and um, 
Pierre is here in the bottom left and, and Christian with uh, Mary Orr in the right. And then, and then the main group of people that were leading this, you can't do these kinds of things without dedicated people who are giving up personal time, family time, diverting their careers and working on something that is, is 10, 15 years um, longevity that takes dedicated, competent people and you can't do it without them. And they were backed up by a large group of people that did all the operational work. And this is a credit to just some of them. Not everybody was able to get into this picture, but this gives you an idea of the, the size of this operation. In my final slide, I don't always eradicate invasive species, but when I do, I need your help. And stay vigilant, my friends. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Taylor. I think that provided a great level of context for our upcoming panel discussion. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. So I have some introductions to do. Okay. So you guys have already met Taylor. He will be one of five panelists on this panel discussion. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Kara Grant. Uh, you saw her picture in Taylor's presentation there. Um, Kara is the Ontario Operational Specialist for Plant Health at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. The CFIA is a science-based regulator dedicated to safeguarding food, animals, and plants, which enhances the health and well-being of Canada's people, environment, and economy. Kara began her career in plant health with the CFIA in the year 2000, following graduation from the University of Guelph which, with a Bachelor of Science in Pure and Applied Ecology. Kara was involved in the Asian longhorn beetle surveys, eradication activities, community information sessions throughout both interceptions in 2003 and 2014. Uh, next, I'll introduce Matthew Gordon. Matthew is the supervisor of forestry inspections in the city of Mississauga's Parks, Forestry and Environment Division. He graduated from the Forestry Technician Program from Sir Stanford Fleming College in 1998. And he was involved in the host species survey and removal work during the 2014 ALHB eradication effort in Mississauga. Uh, next we have Dr. Sandy Smith. Sandy is a professor of forest health in the Institute of Forestry and Conservation at the University of Toronto and is currently a director of forestry programs. She has held numerous academic positions, including past Dean of the Faculty of Forestry and cross appointments with the School of Environment, Department of Ecology and Evol Evolutionary Biology, the Department of Physical and Environmental Sciences at the University of Toronto Scarborough, as well as Environmental Science and Resource Departments in the Universities of Waterloo, Guelph and Algoma. And finally, I will introduce Christian. Christian has been with the urban forest with urban forestry at the city of Toronto since joining the Asian Longhorn Beetle Task Force as a ground surveyor in 2004. In 2006, he took a position as supervisor, uh, tree nursery and natural resource management, overseeing a diverse portfolio that included tree planting, resource management activities, and forest health care. A few of the major forest health care projects that he has managed include a gypsy moth aerial spray and control program, emerald ash borer detection, monitoring and removals, and the Asian longhorn beetle eradication and monitoring, monitoring program from 2013 to 2020. Presently, Christian is supervising tree planting and forest management activities for urban forestry. Uh, so welcome to all of our panelists. Um, I'll ask you if you can maybe join me on video and uh, we can jump into our questions. Um, to the audience, um, you can submit questions to the question box at any time. If you have any questions coming directly from Taylor's talk, you can go ahead and put them in the question box now and we'll get to them. And if there's anything that piques your interest from the questions we're going to start with, um, I'll read through those as we go. Uh, so to get us started, I'm just going to ask a little bit of an icebreaker for our panel. Uh, what is your least favorite invasive species, whether that's Asian longhorn beetle or something else you've had to deal with in your work? Uh, Kara, we'll start with you and we'll just go around the table for this one. Thanks. My least favorite invasive species is the emerald ash borer, mostly because uh, 
I see the effects of uh, that outside my house all the time. It feels like something that we're only managing to slow the spread. And over time, we've seen it move across across Canada. And so it it, it feels, you know, Asian longhorn beetle is, is kind of a feel good. Um, we were able to eradicate it, knock on wood. But uh, yeah, emerald ash borer feels like a, it feels at least in our area right now, you can't replant an ash like you can replant a maple. Um, in those in the area that we eradicated it. Carol, while I have you, do you want to describe your role in the response and eradication efforts of ALB? Okay, yeah, uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So we um, had a, a lot of, you know, doing the surveys, doing the eradication. We play a lead role in developing the policies and uh, looking at the sort of the political. Uh, implications of putting those policies or not putting those policies in place. The idea that if we don't manage a, or control a pest like Asian longhorn beetle, we may not be able to export our lumber products internationally um, because obviously other countries don't want uh, an invasive pest just like we don't want an invasive pest. Um, so I was involved in uh, looking at you know um, the information that was coming from the science panel to look at the different how to apply that into our policies how to apply that into our our um, restrictions to move to move wood and uh, wood products lumber and logs and nursery products worked with the inspectors that were doing the surveys and uh, other staff from the cities that were doing the surveys to provide training and to collaborate the surveys to make sure that every every inch of the area at risk uh, was being surveyed and that everyone had the tools they needed to to be able to survey that uh, lots of early mornings lots of uh, icy cold faces and fingers because all the surveys done in the winter time um, but yeah there's a lot of a lot of collaboration a lot of work a lot of support um, but uh, i worked on both the both the earlier removal and then this more recent one where we just declared eradication in 2020. And uh, there was a lot of change in between because we had experience in the first one to move into the second one. And that was definitely to our advantage. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Kristen, if you want to go next, name your least favorite invasive species and describe a little bit of the role that you played in the ALB eradication. Sure. Uh, where do I start with invasive species? I would say, you know, EAB, gypsy moth, butternut, canker, garlic, mustard, buckthorn. I mean, the, 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 the so list gone. is kind of endless of ones that I can't stand. Sorry. Um, yeah, there's just too many out there, particularly forest affecting forests uh, in you know southern central Ontario. Uh, with regards to uh, ALB, as you mentioned, I was initially brought in as a ground surveyor uh, in February of 2004, not long after uh, the whole operation started, and um, then moved on and started following up on the 1-800 calls that would come in. They had a very good. Uh, communications uh, outreach and uh, CFIA received a lot of calls, uh, people who thought they had the beetle. Um, and so I was actually quite fortunate in being able to go out and follow up on those calls and do tree inspections. Um, eventually I left that program to do some other things with the City of Toronto Forestry. And uh, But when the 2013 uh, infestation was detected, I went back and uh, supervised, helped supervise uh, some of the uh, surveyors who were doing the delimitation survey and then ultimately um, helped manage uh, the, um, the uh, eradication removals in uh, the winter of 2014 and then ongoing survey and monitoring up until uh, 2019, 2020. That's great. Thanks, Christian. Um, Matthew, you want to go next? For sure. Yeah, I I guess it's the same as everyone here. Um, Emerald ash borer um, is probably my least favorite. However, when I was sort of preparing for this, I was looking at some of the slideshows of Asian longhorn beetle and the devastation, removing the maple willow poplar birch. It sort of banged into my head, maple willow poplar birch. And in the Mississauga portion, it was in a ravine and a water course. So willows, Manitoba maples, sugar maples, it was just devastated, right? So to see the effect on, um, I guess it's more host species really sort of affects the Asian longhorn beetle versus the emerald ash borer. Um, and my role is, I guess, it was a bit of a liaison between the city of Mississauga, um, the CFIA and the city of Toronto, just to try to help coordinate things um, for resources and 
and try to get things to work properly. So, um, yeah. Thanks. Sandy, you want to go ahead? Sure. I don't know why you guys don't like EAB. <laughs> <laughs> It's actually one of my favorite. It, we, as a biological control researchers, it's one where we might actually be able to get some, some uh, use out of some of the, these natural enemies, unlike Asian longhorn beetle, which so far has been eradicated. Um, you know, I was going to say carp, you know, <laughs> or something in the aquatic system, the, because as an entomologist, I've worked a lot with these different species, and you, you get close to them when you're a researcher. I'm a research scientist, so you you kind of, you don't see the economics as much as the science, which makes them all interesting. But my least favorite, I think, is, um, will be uh, hemlock woolly adulged in beech bark scale because of the large impacts that they will have on a landscape level. They're quiet. They're not uh, macro photogenic. They are sort of, I would say, insidious. And so those are the ones I sort of feel as more dangerous because we'll lose some really important tree species. In urban environments, we can figure out how to put new ones back. Um, my role with the, the group was, as again, uh, Taylor has really nicely outlined the science panel. So I was brought in from the university. Um, it came partly because I went in 2001 and two to work with the USDA. Uh, they have a biological control lab in France. And so I anticipated that if Canada was gonna get Asian longhorn beetle, and we knew it was one of the ones, it was a, a known unknown, the CFIA already had it flagged. And I figured it would be good to sort of find out what the US is doing about it in Europe. And they hadn't, they had just found it in Austria. And so there was a lot of research ongoing. But when I came back in 2002, what we had found was emerald ash borer instead of Asian longhorn beetle. And it wasn't until the next year. But I guess as a research scientist, um, what you know what I, we were doing is answering questions as Taylor outlined all those questions and I like to say sometimes um, not only were we identifying like we would identify where all the gaps were there were often not answers to the questions that we were being asked but we had to come up with the best uh, guess I would say the educated guess talking to our colleagues in the literature and trying to say okay we're not sure how it'll how far it'll fly but this is what other systems show us so it was the science piece that's great thanks sandy uh taylor i know you're not on video i don't want to forget about you do you <laughs> want to name your least favorite invasive species yeah sure um well i'll give you a, just a quick one down also on my role for the age long field so i started out as leading the, as provincial entomologist for the province in charge of the, uh, sitting on the science panel, but also leading the um, the uh, field staff that were lent to the program that were appointed as inspectors by the CFIA to participate in the surveys and doing all the communications. So that was that was an interesting time. And while I was there uh, in the Thistletown area, I was with Beth McEwen from the city of Toronto and she pointed out a plant that I had no familiarity with, and that was dog strangling by. And she showed how it, could, you know, its roots could go from one side of the sidewalk to the other and just take over a site. So that actually has, that's one of those trees that are plants that I really find it's very difficult to work in is to can completely take over a site, dominate it and, um, and really keep out the native vegetation. And uh, to me, it's a real serious impact in the areas where it is. And if it continues to spread, it's going to slowly take over and dominate our, our forest site. So that would go on my list of one of the least wanted uh, invasive species. Um, thanks, Taylor. Uh, so I'm going to jump in. I have a couple of questions and there's a few questions coming in from the audience already. Uh, so I'm going to start with, um, do you think that there are any challenges or obstacles that you overcame during these efforts that could potentially help inform future response to invasive pests? Okay, anybody who wants to jump in can go ahead. I mean, I'm just going to jump quickly because um, I, I think I don't know how much time we'll have for all the questions. But again, as Taylor said, this collaboration is what makes it stand out to me as a program um, is the different levels. The governments were able to work together and it wasn't easy, I'm sure, at many times. And to to separate the science panel from the technical and operations, I thought was in incredibly important for this project. 
and um, it's usually the challenges that are out there. It's the people challenges. It's, it's not so much the pest, it's trying to figure out how to do it uh, as a team. Thanks, Sandy. Does anybody else have anything to add? I could add, I think, um, some of the biggest part, at least, um, is to ask for help. Because I think a lot of times when we're different, well, for the federal government, you kind of assume that, you know, it's yours, it's under your act of regulation, it's your uh, regulated past, it's yours to deal with. And recognizing that, you know, something like this project through collaboration, you actually have a better chance of meeting your goals if you work collaboratively to, you know, for that, for that project. And then on the same kind of, I guess, on that same uh, note, it's offering assistance. So recognizing where within your own acts, policies, regulations, restrictions, but where you can offer your support and actually doing that, knowing that it's something that um, maybe in some way, shape or form does, does impact you, like the Asian longhorn beetle, you know, Matt was saying, it's all in the parks and, you know, the trees are in the parks and the cities are managing those trees in the parks and, you know, CFIA is managing the, the, um, you know, the imports and the exports and the policies and you got the university students that are sitting underneath the trees to, you know, in, either to enhance their own education, their own research, or to just get a break. Like everybody is involved. And so recognizing, you know, that when to ask for help and then also when to offer help um, is, a, is a big challenge, but it's a, it's a good one. I think we were able to accomplish that and a bit of a barrier, but. Definitely, thanks Kara. Matt or Christian, do you have anything to add there? Challenges? Uh, I think, you know, Taylor covered it well. I mean, I think I think the relationships were already established even before Asian longhorn beetle was detected in Toronto. So uh, urban forestry was involved. I know that the local CFIA office had made contact already with uh, the director of urban forestry and other people of the city. So once it once it was detected, I think they were able to get off the mark very quickly. And, uh, you know, again, everybody brought their own skill set. Uh, the city of Toronto brought the technical operational capabilities of dealing with large numbers of tree removals, helping with uh, surveying, um, that kind of thing. And of course, uh, the inspection agency, um, you know, was the lead uh to you know define the issue and then bringing in the help of the mnr and and you know people like sandy and the universities so those relationships were built sort of prior to i think the um the detection and that that really helped uh get things off the mark very quickly for sure Matt, anything to add before we move on I think the big, the, the collaboration was the resources. I mean, the majority of the, the 14 work was in Mississauga and we didn't have the resources like the city of Toronto did to do just the boots on the ground, the data collectors, the contractors. I mean, how many crews were there, Christian? Do you remember? I don't remember. We had 33 removal crews, I think, and, you know, dozens of uh, data collectors who were inspecting the trees that came down for signs of the beetle. So it was a big operation. We were working out of a fair, you know, a, a trailer in, in Wildwood Park. It was, you know, every day there early in the morning and during the day and the, when it was dark and leaving when it was dark. And, and you know, the, just the weather, we were actually quite fortunate with the weather. It was, it was very cold, which allowed us to get into some of those areas that you mentioned, Matthew, that were, you know, ravines and forested areas. We had a river we had to cross to get to some of the trees and we were lucky it froze and they were able to get a number, a significant number of trees removed, you know, before it broke up in March. So, um, yeah, it was a real, it was, uh, you know, a lot of balls in the air and a lot of people involved. Uh, for sure. For sure. Uh, Taylor, do you have anything to add in in terms of challenges that you guys faced or? Yeah, there was one that um, um, I glossed over and that was there, there were some people that opposed what we were doing. Um, we had some difficulty with um, uh, cemeteries because, of, you know, you're, you're cutting down trees that were planted in memoriam or your rare species, uh, rare specimens. Uh, those were a challenge that we had to overcome, um, as well as the woodlots uh, where, you know, do you level a woodlot or not? What's the protocol for that? Um, and so we, you know, we started at the edge and moved in until we didn't find any more infested trees. Or in one case, we cut the woodlot, but it was over several years and ended up 
could have it should have just been cut at the beginning but you know it was you know, like we're trying to preserve that that site um, and one of the other things we had was was people that were thought we should be using the insecticide which was the technique in most of the areas in the u.s um, where you inject the trees or the soil with an insecticide and then you continue the survey and, and, and see if you got them all. We were taking a more aggressive approach and cutting those trees and anything nearby. Um, and so one of the ways that we, uh, we created those people was that once the a tree replacement program was put in place later on in 2004, uh, then a lot of the concerns was, well, uh, it's a shame you have to cut these trees but at least you're putting something back. And, and even though overall there wasn't a big uptake from the uh, landowners, the residents to replace their trees, this is the fact that they knew that that was there was helpful for, that, for them and to accept the fact that, yeah, that was a beautiful tree in their, in their yard or on the street that needed to be cut, but it's a beautiful city, beautiful province, and a beautiful country that we needed to take that drastic action to protect that resource. And it meant sacrificing some trees. But knowing that there was a tree replacement program led by the CFIA, uh, then that, that helped a lot to uh, help it, to people to accept the program. For sure. Thanks, Taylor. Um, has your involvement in this eradication changed the way you work with invasive species at all today? <laughs> For some of Taylor, you, probably I guess I can, not. Yeah. <laughs> I can say something about that. So, you know, once you know, I had moved on. We um, dealing with forest health care issues in the city of Toronto, Gypsy Moth in particular, you know, um, and EAB. So, you know, a lot of the connections, a lot of the um, relationships um, were uh, were made during ALH, ALHB days, Asian Longhorn Beetle days. And so it was very helpful. You knew the people, you knew, you know, I moved, you know, beforehand, I didn't know what CFIA was and I didn't know, you know, that it, you know, regulated forest pests, but, you know, you learn pretty quickly, you learn about the regulations and the roles and, uh, you know, through those other regulated pests and the issues that we've had with them, um, you know, it definitely helped uh, having established relationships and knowing where to go for assistance. Uh, whether it was with, uh, you know, the uh, MNRF or the University of Toronto or CFIA. For sure. Thanks, Christian. Anybody else have any changes? Kara, I'm sure it's pretty well the same for you. But <laughs> Well, it is, except that um, Taylor had mentioned uh, we have uh, the Critical Plant Pest Management Council, and um, that kind of the setting up of that allows our you know, all of our collaborators to get together when we encounter either there's a flag ra uh, raised about a potential risk for an invasive or when we do find an invasive, it allows us or gives you us the, the venue to sit down and look at how we can work together or where it falls within, you know, whose responsibilities and who's got what tools. And um, it really does kind of, it opens up the discussion on a level that I don't think we really had before and the precedent was set with, with, with Asian longhorn beetle and allowed for that. And they connect in regularly with their, you know, with our science panel on multiple different pests to provide different programs and, and suggest different um, kind of uh, to outline the, the risks and the potential um, management options that we might have. And Sandy might have more to that effect, but um, yeah, it, it's given us a better, a, a great tool to use when we, when we look at all these different pests and compare and how we're going to manage them or, or you know, you know, attack them. <laughs> I don't well, think from a, sorry, from a science end, I don't think, you know, it's, um, it hasn't really changed how science people, we're, I, I think we're just here to help um, at some level and we wait to be called upon. I mean, I hope that, and it's good to hear that the panels, if is you create, committees and I think it really worked well in this project where you you have the science but it is not the, the main driver like it's a resource that is so important and um, I think that always will remain in that sense that uh, opportunities for um, you know not only for students to learn like and I think about so many students don't really understand how this works right Christian you're saying you didn't know about CFIA and you know, it's just the way it works. And so it's important that um, we we at least be able to help from the science. And as we've seen with COVID, you know, it has to be science-based and evidence-based. I mean, 
this is where the best decisions come from, I think, you know, and is to find that science and reach out for it. Because sure. scientists are all in their own little world working on something that they think is important until they get called upon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I think from my perspective, it was a good experience for, for myself and also all the data collectors just to see the consequences of some of these invasive species. In Mississauga, emerald ash borer removals hadn't started full on yet, so it, it was really the a really eye-opener and also the, so the consequences and also it, it sort of informed you know decision-making moving forward, right? Now the staff that were working know the consequences of what can happen if these invasive species take root, so it was a real eye-opener, that's for sure. Absolutely, that's a great point. Taylor, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I'd like to pick up where, where Kara was um, and talk a little bit about that federal provincial relationship. For sure. I'll give you a little story. When I started early in my career in the early 90s, and an and European pine shoot beetle was found in Ontario, and I went to my director at the time and uh, and said, We found this new insect. We're not sure what it means, but it's a, it's a, it's a non native species. And he said, Well, whose responsibility is it? And I said, Well, it's at the time, Agriculture Ag Food Canada's responsibility, CFIA. And he said, well, what are you doing in my office? So <laughs> fast forward a few more years, and it's recognized that these problems are much bigger than any one agency can handle. And everybody has a vested interest in, um, in dealing with it collaboratively. And the other thing that I, I noticed that one of the things I learned out of this was, and Sandy alluded to this, and that there's a lot of parallels with responding to an emergency like COVID. And one of the things that we did under this prolonged emergency response for Asian longhorn beetle was um, an incident command system where you, you had a firmly decided who was in charge, you had a good organizational structure, who was operational, a lot of that was led by the city of Toronto, who was responsible for intelligence and surveys. Uh, you know, that's the survey crew and operations implementation. It was all divided up with an incident command system that is what we're now using and how we organize ourselves, at least in my organization federally, and how we organize ourselves in response to the COVID urgency, um, because you have to break up all those responsibilities and have unity of command, uniformity of command, effective communications, good operations, all those kind of things. There's certainly a lot of parallels in uh, in how you respond to a prolonged in, uh, eradication program and a prolonged health urgency. Absolutely. Thanks, Taylor. Um, I'm going to jump over to a couple of the audience questions that have come in. Uh, Diane's asking, this one's to you, Taylor. Uh, it says, Taylor showed a map of range or projective range of ALB. The range area stopped north of Barrie, south of Lake Nipissing. Can you tell me anything of the science behind that boundary line on the map? Uh, Tamagami is not much further north and is a prime location for U.S. cottagers and vacationers. Well, you know, I was warning about that map myself when I when I put that in there because I saw that orange boundary on there, and I'm not sure what that's supposed to show. <laughs> it's not the range of it's not the potential range of Asian longhorn beetle in Canada or in Ontario. So um, I'm not sure the origin of that map um, and what that's supposed to show. It's not the Great Lake St. Lawrence forest as much because that continues on uh, further north. So um, I'm not sure what that orange is. So that's certainly not the um, the range, that color zone was not the range of Asian longhorn beetle. Certainly wherever there's maple, wherever there is um, aspen and birch, uh, that's a potential range for this insect. Mm -hmm. Taylor, you're probably hoping nobody would catch that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine, it's a good question. Good, qu thank you. Um, and this isn't for anybody in particular, so anybody who has any thoughts can go ahead and answer. Uh, what importance do you give molecular-based identification techniques? Do you consider integrating them into current biosurveillance programs? I think we brought it into this, didn't we, guys? Uh, in the second. Yeah, we did. Yeah, so there yeah. was some work done by, um, by uh, Amanda Rowe and, and as well as by the U.S. on that. Um, and um, so it's certainly showing that that... 2013 infestation is genetically related to the 2003. So that gives us confidence that it's not a separate new infestation, that it's 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 probably the same source. Uh, probably the uh, Mississauga one originated in Toronto and the Toronto one originated in China. Um, and it's genetically different from some of the other infestations, but it seems to be close to the Ohio infestation. But uh, Amanda's still doing some work on that. Awesome, thanks. 
in the CFA, we've actually, I was going to say in the CFA, we've expanded. We still, we do use that um, with uh, the gypsy moth survey. So with our gypsy moth survey, we have uh, the European gypsy moth, which is typically the one that you would see. Sometimes people call it the North American gypsy moth, but there is an Asian variety that we will, when we do our trapping, when we get egg masses, we'll send them to the lab to analyze, to see if it is the Asian variety or not, because you can't, um, to, to look at them, uh, you need to have that genetics to support it. The response to the Asian variety is different than the European variety based on the, the risk of spread and the, and, you know, the, and the intensity to which it, it, um, it spreads or infest, infests the trees. Awesome. Thanks, Kara. Does anybody else have anything to add on that? Or? I wasn't going to add on the genetics, but I was going to, and you're talking about the boundary, the northern boundary, and, and I guess, you know, we're all feeling good about ALHB in Canada right now. Yes, congratulations, <laughs> everyone, yes. But there's still infestations in the States. And I know, when, and, and Taylor alluded to this, when the committee sat down and said, you know, could it possibly be somewhere else? And you go, I, the one place we know where it's not is where we've intensively sampled, but you don't know what people might have moved north. And so I would just say with such a wonderful photogenic <laughs> insect, people should keep their eyes open in cottage country and wherever, because you know there were no big barriers put up. There were signs, but I can see now with COVID even that sometimes people don't buy into the science. <laughs> so we need to keep, we have to remain vigilant. That's all I would say. Sure. I don't want to end on a down note, but just, stay on it <laughs> that's a great point sandy thanks what did you call it taylor i think uh persistence or something <laughs> vigilance no i use the term vigilance stay vigilant okay. my friend yep yep did you guys as a group ever come across any issues deciding on the best course of action um amongst all of your collaborative groups and if so how did you go about determining what action to take i would say operationally there were a few times when we had some minor things but you know cfia had the hammer with the plant protection act so we were able to utilize that on occasion um during the removals in mississauga we had some recalcitrant uh, folks but um you know, I think it was, it, yeah, there wasn't, I wouldn't say any, nothing stands out to me at my level, at least of uh, any, uh, you know, cross anybody at cross purposes or anything like that. I just remember we had lots of discussions about those host trees, Taylor. I mean, your, your list makes it look pretty straightforward, but we had lots of back and forth and not knowing answers to a lot of the questions and how long do we investigate it and if an insect can lay eggs in it and can it does it rear through and produce viable offspring it was a great kind of dull for most people <laughs> like it's a science <laughs> question but you know it's kind of like well should we require them to cut down their cherry trees and their apple trees like i mean i remember that clearly maybe that just stood out in my mind taylor but <laughs> it was one yeah that's a good point to, and it, because they're one of the issues we had was, and let's go back to that question about genomics, in that it seems the different uh, sources of Asian longhorn beetle in China perform differently in, in a new range, and that includes the host species. So in Chicago, the number two host species was horse chestnut after maple. And we, in our program, we cut down the horse chestnuts. We didn't find a single infested horse chestnut. Um, so we had to do that work to determine what the, um, uh, what the host range actually was, and then the, we had to do some research on seeing what other hosts are out there and what to do. We had Tilia or Linden or Basswood. Um, we had some, a couple of those individuals. One had over 1,100 egg-laying pits on it, over position pits, and nothing survived. So is that a host or not? Do you cut those trees or not? And so we made the decision that they're not a host, even though they were heavily uh, attacked for egg-laying, they were not a viable host. And one of the other questions we had that was a little bit challenging was on the question of insecticides. In that we were de deviating from the program that the time was being done in the United States, was, which was survey cut infested trees and treat surrounding trees with insecticide. We were far more aggressive and we were cutting those trees uh, and chipping them. And yet we had 
uh, U.S. experts on our panel who were part of the U.S. program. So we in Canada were doing something that was more aggressive than what our, our friends from the United States were doing. So um, that put them in a little bit of a difficult situation because they're part of a panel that was going forward saying cut and chip in the U.S. They were doing mostly uh, cut, cut and insecticide treatment. And I, But I think now they've migrated in those larger infestations like like the Ohio one, they're doing more of the cut and chip rather than the insecticide treatments. Great, thanks Taylor. Um, we have one more question that came in from the audience while we were talking there, so I'll, I'll bring that one up. Um, where do we report if we believe we have seen an ALB and are there any potential lookalikes that may be confused for ALB? Good That's question. Terrible. That's Kara. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the CFIA on our website, there is a there is a, um, uh, a spot there if you've seen a pest. I believe it's on like in the plant health side on the very beginning. You can call your local office and uh, sorry, so I had some background noise. It's really, um, uh, yeah, so on our main our main website, there's a, if you found the pest, you can report it. Just contact us, and we can report a pest there. If you, we have um, call your local CFA office. We do have a local uh, lookalike. It's the um, oh now the pine sawyer beetle, and it's a longhorn beetle. It's uh, kind of a dark gray, a dark brown, blackish color, kind of slightly iridescent. Has some white spots on it, but it has a characteristic white mark on kind of at the at the bottom of its neck sort of between its wings there and um but we did notice a lot of people calling you know when when we're out when all the the staff are out in the uh and doing tree removals it brings a lot of attention and you have a lot more people asking what are you looking for what are you looking at why are you looking at my tree and what are you doing and you know those people then go up to their cottage and you know they see what they see and and report it we had even a number you know this summer people were not traveling out of country people uh, were traveling to their cottages and going camping we were noticing a lot of an influx of calls of people saying i, I think i found it you go on the website and you know frankly if they call us with something that they think looks like it it's just as well um, it's just as good as calling us with then, you know, with it actually there. So, um, yeah, we depend on people to, to look at our website, to look at whatever signs to, and, uh, to call when they think they found something that looks similar or recognize that not everybody's an entomologist. Although maybe people are closer now with COVID helping their kids with their homework in, uh, in biology, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we rely on, on people to ask. Yeah, I was going to say, this is like COVID, where zeros really matter, like you're happy to have a zero. And I think Taylor said it before, we all, you know, zeros were good signs. <laughs> so we count when I, them. When I was doing the 1-800 calls, yeah, there were a lot of people who would catch a, a bug. It, I mean, just about any beetle. Um, but, you know, white spotted sawyer, western conifer seed bug, sometimes box elder bugs, just about uh, just about anything. But um, those were some of the main ones, particularly white spotted sawyer and western conifer seed bug. We even get some pictures sent to us here at the ISC of white spotted sawyers every once in a while. Is the station longhorn beetle? So it's kind of nice to say, no, I don't think it is, but don't send this to us, send it to CFI. <laughs> yeah. um, so what is one piece of advice that you would give to someone working on an eradication project? Not necessarily Asian longhorn beetle specific, but any kind of eradication project. Taylor gave a summer advice. vacation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was gonna say. Um, I mean, it, it when it comes in, like at first, you you expect some of these things, you know, just to be uh, in passing. You hope that it's a zero, a negative, but anticipate that it's not going to be, and uh, that it's gonna take a lot of time. Like Christian was saying, we were there working on it from. You know, sun up to sundown. So it's important to make sure you take your breaks, and um, you know that you ask for help. 
and that you recognize that people are going to, you know, that there's a, a collaborative effort and people are going to need help and to look at ways you can help. It may not be with um, with staff, it may not be with resources, it may be just forwarding a link, uh, engaging, um, sharing. But uh, yeah, it, it's hard to imagine just how much energy it can take out of you. So it is important to recognize your well-being and, and offer support. Um, so in terms of advice just with some of those people. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, was gonna... <laughs> I was just going to say quickly is like, I think I mentioned it before uh, and Taylor's brought it up, but the separation of the science from the operations, I, I think that would be one of mine, aside from collaboration, et cetera, but that separation so that the science uh, group is sort of a reference and, and then the decisions aren't made by the science people. Uh, science people don't want to be deciding is that impossible to do or does that cost too much money or whatever. They're, they're asked sort of the, the basic information. And the other piece that I don't think has maybe come out, I, I with this program, I think uh, Jean Turgeon was a key part of this program for, for everyone with the King Forest Service, but linked with everyone, the collaboration Having a point person, I, I mean, I'm interested to see what my colleagues think, but having that point person that sort of could decide, sort of triage, made some decisions um, and knew when to pull the information from the partners that he needed. Um, I think that really worked well in this case. And I think that's important that mm -hmm. I would give advice. Have the right person at the, <laughs> at the helm. Thanks, Sandy. I'd add, um, be prepared for what I call panarchy, things that happen outside your control. Um, it, it, you know, you're, you're in this for a long haul, and when you have a you have an election, and all of a sudden you get a new minister, and you have to bring them up to speed, and they may not be keen on this, or election is called, and you're in the middle of cutting down trees, and it's like, oh, they don't want controversy. There might be some some people don't like this, and all of a sudden uh, a politician might put a stop to a program that you, as a science or technical or operational person, are kind of like not living in that same political world. So things happen outside your control, uh, and you know we saw that with Brown's Bruce Longhorn Beetle in uh, in Nova Scotia, where Hurricane Juan came along, and despite all the efforts of control and eradication, you know it moved it tens or hundreds of kilometers inland in in one day. Um, so things happen outside your control, and um, you know the 2013 discovery, rediscovery of Asian longhorn beetle, that's a bit disheartening. You know when you you've done all this hard work and then you find out that there was a, there was a, an insect that had been moved probably to a new site, and then you're you're back at it again. It's like putting out a forest fire and then it erupts a couple of days later, and you thought you had it out. So you need to be prepared for those things that happen outside your control. Mm -hmm. For sure. That's a great point, Taylor. Matthew, um, question, I think? Yeah, just, uh, you know, Taylor mentioned this before as well, sort of the attrition that kind of comes with time. Uh, these things take time. And, you know, you have surveyors who are going out every day and doing the same thing. And, and you know, you have to keep people motivated. And it's 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 really challenging to uh, to motivate people whose job it is to actually do the detections in particular when you're getting into a monitoring phase. Uh, so that's that that's a real challenge and I don't have really any answers as far as that goes, but um, that was, you know, that got to be a big challenge for both, I think both at the end of the phase one and, and phase two as well. Um, you know, the first few years, everybody's pretty energized, um, but uh, with time when you're doing the same thing and based on, you know, so for the for the monitoring, particularly with the Mississauga Toronto infestation 2013, you know we had uh, what was it four 537 cells that we had to monitor uh, trees in, and we were doing them every two years. Um, so they had to be done th three times over a five year period. Um, so you know you're sending sometimes the same people out year after year to do the same thing, and it's 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 a challenge. I would say. Sure. I think a little bit is to know the the various stakeholders. So in in Mississauga, we don't uh, 
the region appealed as our, our waste removal. So we didn't have a dump location in the regulated area. So we had all this debris that was coming out of it that we didn't have anywhere in Peel where we could dump it, right? Or just then having having all the contacts and, and all that in place was was really important, right? So at least having some provisions for that for, you know, if something happens down the road, just thinking who you can speak to about about those issues. For sure. I think great Rosa. points from everybody. Go ahead. One last thing I was going to say is uh, maybe we forgot about it because we were all happy to be there, but finding a place where we could physically work together, that was a challenge because trying to, you know, you've got CFIA, we've got inspectors and that, and everybody's got their offices. We don't have the space. The city of Toronto, they've got their trucks going in and out, Mississauga, like they've got their inspectors here and there, but nobody, you know, trying to find a spot where we could gather everybody together, all of their crews, all their equipment, all of our maps, all of our, um, you know, even just have a spot where we can sit down and talk that's outside, that's sort of that, um, uh, non, you know, that collaborative space. It was challenging to find that, you know, somewhere, you know, we talked about working in a trailer, that was because we weren't working in any one particular office we had to create our own we had to find a spot for it and you know it's winter time so you need heat you need to be there all day you need some place to eat facilities bathrooms, washroom facilities cleaned, right um, the cleaning of the bathrooms parking and vehicles <laughs> yeah that was that was a you know that that took a lot of a lot of work and background just to try and figure out that where are we going to work from where are we going to collaborate from where are we going to situate ourselves that were central to the work i think with covid now it, sorry someplace yeah. close to coffee <laughs> there's a mcdonald's across right but i, I yeah. think with covid now and i look at the pictures of all, everyone jammed into those trailers i mean how would it be now right we'd need 100 trailers right or it just yeah it's 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 something that's for sure yeah, yeah, I mean, so I want to talk about uh, space because we're in COVID, so we don't even connect actually seeing real people <laughs> working in the real space. But yeah, you know, a, lot, was... a lot needs to come together, you know, and a lot, you know, there are terms of contracts that you're using contractors. There's collective agreements. There's there are all these things that have to sort of come together and, you know, there has to be some flexibility. But it's it's so it's it's a lot of it's a lot of pieces. It's a lot of moving pieces um, to put it together to make it operational. And, you know, we were, I think, fortunate. Um, you know, in 20, well, both in both investations, but in, you know, 2013, where, you know, we had we had a central location um, and we were able to sort of create a temporary office and, and work location, um, you know, temporary wood dump as well in the parking lot in the park. And and uh, but, it, it, you know, it all worked out. But, it you know, it was a challenge bringing all the pieces together. For sure. Um... So everybody has mentioned how this probably wouldn't have been possible without the level of collaboration that happened, right? So what do you, and maybe this answer is gonna be different for everybody, but uh, what do you think was the greatest benefit of that level of collaboration? If you can pinpoint anything or just that it was helpful as a whole. I mean, I think the outcome of the eradication work, right? We were able to remove the host species within the the, the time period was the, that was a success, I think. I think the, you know, ongoing relationships um, that were established between the different levels of government and agencies um, were really helpful moving forward for, you know, with other pest, invasive pest issues. Absolutely. I would agree with both of those. <laughs> like I, I, I think it was. I mean, I don't know if it had been a different insect. Um, you know, would we have been able? Would all if we still had all these pieces and this collaboration, could we have solved EAB if it had been the same situation? And I'm not so sure because it's just a different insect. But certainly in this case, I think it led to a solution the ability to move fast and be coordinated. I was going to say, you know, I think I, I vaguely remember this at the beginning is that when at CFIA, I think when they were looking to delineate and trying to figure it out, I think people were surprised that the city of Toronto had all this tree inventory data, which of course the city would have this data, but nobody would have appreciated that they did. And I guess, you know, I was familiar with it having worked with the city, but you know, 
it's just sort of all this knowledge of what resources each group has and how they can bring it to the team was very beneficial i think as christian's saying definitely Mm -hmm. I think, you know, it also it took some courage on behalf of CFIA to say, yeah, we're going to try to eradicate this pest because, you know, we're talking millions and millions of dollars over a 16, 17 year period. So there was a big commitment there. And I think it's, you know, it's not always possible depending on the pest, but maybe sometimes even if it is possible, it's it's a daunting challenge and and the will might not necessarily be there. But in this case, it was so. Absolutely. Yeah, in That's preparation for this, I was going back over some of my communications on budgets I had put together for proposals and science and areas. And I mean, they're all based on educated guesses and the science of, you know, coming from different countries all to support the eradication proposal. You know, what if we do this? What if we don't do this? And what are the consequences? And I mean, a big one was that the main host was going to, you know, with maple and maple syrup being huge, or, you know, logging industry. And what happens if we don't? And it spreads. The consequences um, really did support the, you know, the the cost of it. And uh, but yeah, I had there was lots of back and forth, lots of notes, lots of science, lots of mm. numbers. But um, yeah, but then we also had our previous. Um, incursion that we were able to support this again. So the the experience and w of the first eradication was was a little bit different than the second one because the second one we had a lot of our um, our lessons learned and information you know built up and expanded on. We had more science, we had more information, we had more strategy, um, more information, you know, more questions to ask and more answers to to search for. So that definitely that that helped definitely um i you just had me thinking a little bit karen i have a question um so what and maybe other people can jump in as well if there was more involvement outside of cfia but when you're trying to make that decision when you're writing your proposals and whatnot um, to make the decision to actually go forward with the eradication what was everybody's involvement there? Like, was it mainly CFI making those decisions or did you have the science panel involved at that stage? Or how did that work? If you could maybe touch on that a little bit more. I was gonna say, Taylor, you may wanna, I, I, I'm sure that question would have come up, but I think it was more with CFIA, if I remember. Well, yeah, certainly CFIA was the ultimate decision maker on that. Right. And uh, and that's where you know some of the politics comes in because people had their views and they wanted something done and um, certainly the city of Toronto wanted something done York Region then in 2003 Vaughan and the Ministry of Natural Resources they all wanted something done and by coming to the table and saying we're going to you know this is a big problem we're going to do it collectively and we had we had a couple of successes that we could go by um, there had been a an eradication of uh, citrus longhorn beetle on the Pacific Northwest in the US. And we said, that's where our model came from of cut, chip, search and destroy. Um, because we said, let's do it that way because we think that could be successful. Um, and then and then there was there were discussions and briefing notes and and there was a, I know my own provincial minister wrote a letter uh, to the um, to the federal minister saying, uh, we, we'd like to work with you on this. Uh, and we'd like to create this critical plant pest management committee and and collaborate federally provincially. So you know there was that al already that spirit of um, this is too big for one agency. We need to do this to protect the resources for Ontario and Canada. And I think we had the model like Chicago. I was trying to remember whether they had actually declared then yet, but I mean they appeared to be able to do eradication, or they were moving in that direction, reducing each year. Uh, not so much New York City, like those were the two predecessors to ours, but I think we were encouraged that that, that was possible. And I think it was getting that delineation, like once we could figure out where it was, and you never know that right away, but you got a sense, oh, I think it's, I wouldn't say contained, but it's in a manageable area. I mean, this was very much in contrast that I remember with emerald ash borers when 
went down to Windsor and every scout who was coming in from the field was finding a positive on EAB. That wasn't the case for Asian longhorn beetle. And as an entomologist, if you get a lot of zeros, that means that it's not as big as you thought. And mm -hmm. whereas EAB was already, you know, pretty well spread without knowing anything about the biology of these two species at that time. But so there was signs, I think, for the science panel, uh, Taylor, that we could, it, it, it was worth a shot <laughs> if somebody yeah, wanted to invest the money. <laughs> it was worth a shot. And, you know, you mentioned emerald ash borer, which was found yep. in 2002. And ironically, when it was found in Windsor in Detroit 2002, it was already in Toronto. We just hadn't found it yet. Right. Um, and, and you mentioned Chicago, uh, you know, they, they hadn't eradicated it by the time we started, but they were having some success. And it was showing that this, uh, this the, the aggressiveness was was working, and we had the city forester uh, Joe McCarthy come from Chicago to meet with the science panel uh, in the early days in September to give us the benefit of his his expertise and experience. Right, and we had uh, the U.S. USDA um, what was his name Smith, uh, who was on the he was working with them in the U.S. and so he was on the panel. So we had a a conduit to the US. I think that was what was really helpful, I remember at the time, because you, you started to feel more um, assured of your own decisions that you're making, your your best guesses, <laughs> but you, you had more information. And as, as Taylor said at the beginning when he was talking about it, it wasn't published. This wasn't published information, most of it. It's it sort of word of mouth in the, the community, mm -hmm. scientific community, I should say. <laughs> Yeah, we also had the advantage of um, CFI had been doing surveys for Asian longhorn beetle in some of the high risk areas um, since well 2000. That's when I was hired. That's what I was hired to do was to run the survey in the GTA and um, survey. And we were surveying across Canada looking for Asian longhorn beetle and that carried on even right through. Right. So even though we were doing our eradication program and and removing trees across Canada, there was still surveys going on for Asian longhorn beetle looking for some of those areas that were higher risk, some of the areas that might be, you know, storing wood pallets or firewood or, um, you know, importing logs, those kind of from the United States, even those kind of places, right? So um, we had that to support us in our decision and, you know, to look at the as far as a detection or delimitation survey as well as some of the other figures that had come from everywhere as far as our exporting commodities and what that what impacts based on our host our host trees and, and how that's going to impact our, our import or our export based on having a pest that other countries would not want. Mm -hmm. sure. that, that's a really interesting point, Kara, that you know there was an excitement, there was an expectation that you know after the Chicago New York discoveries uh, that we might we might have it and there were there was a lot of there were a lot of people who were looking actively for it wanting to be the ones that found it uh, and there were a lot of a lot of false reports but there were a lot of people that were looking for that insect there was an excitement and expectation we were the lucky ones <laughs> <laughs> that's why i went to france originally was as i expect but you could you could almost anticipate that it's going to be an urban area so it's chicago new york you look at Canada, what are our choices here? Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, uh, Halifax. Like, you know, it's going to be one of those probably, yeah. maybe Hamilton. <laughs> okay, everyone, we have about four minutes left. So I just want to, I've been asking questions all afternoon. So if anybody else has anything that we haven't touched on that, you know, you, something that may not be common knowledge that you'd want somebody to know or something interesting that you want to share, uh, I'm going to leave you guys the floor for the last couple of minutes. I, I'm, I'm going to share something because I always do. I'm a biological control researcher, as I said. Um, and both of these I got involved because I thought, oh, there'll be opportunities to provide some knowledge and information and description about the, the natural controls. Um, and it didn't work out for Asian longhorn beetle because it's really hard to work on biocontrol when CFIA is eradicating. You, it, it, you cannot find the insect when you're trying, and so you, research is very limited and that didn't work out. But EAB, and I'm jumping to there, 
also went down to work with that and the, the decision was made not to, we're going to eradicate. So when the eradication decision, all the money goes there and there's none for biocontrol. But in the end, we're back at biocontrol for EAB. I mean, it's great if we can eradicate and I'm all for it, but we're always, biocontrol is always the last ditch effort. <laughs> when everything else fails, you're, you're back. So I'm plug for, you know, don't leave us to the last bit. <laughs> Even if it doesn't work out like ALHB, that's fine. At least we were there. For sure. Anybody else have anything they want to add? Well, I'll add something that uh, I glossed over a little bit, and that's and that's that um, the Toronto program and then the Mississauga one were unlike some of the U.S. ones, and, and Sandy just sort of mentioned it, and that's that in the U.S., they were more or less focused on eradication and the operational aspects of it. And we said, well, maybe there's some science and data and stuff that we could do as we're doing this. So we hatched the idea of having a CFS or, C or m &R and, um, and then a city person uh, looking at each tree as it's cut to see if it's infested and not just taking it to the chipper. It slowed things down a little bit because it had to, you know, there's a delay when it was dropped to the ground. But in the end, it provided us with very important data on success or efficacy of the, of the survey, uh, what things look like in different weather conditions and, and um, what trees were actually infested, what weren't, all that kind of information was very helpful. And then it led to the general chronology work. So that was all very good to have for, for us to have that data. And that's why some of our American colleagues were so keen to have part of this because they could, um, they could get data that helped them in their own programs. Mm -hmm. For sure. Thanks, Taylor. Uh, so we're at about one minute left, so I think we can wrap up. Um, thank you everyone for joining me today. I think that was a great discussion. Hopefully our audience learned a lot and maybe took some advice that you guys had to share. Um, I'm hoping to see everybody in the audience here tomorrow morning at uh, 9 a.m. Uh, our first session of the day tomorrow will be about wild pigs and Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry updates. Um, so I hope to see you there. And again, a big thank you to all of our panelists today. Um, I hope to talk to you guys soon. Thanks again. Thanks. Thank you. Great, right, thanks. Bye. Okay, bye everyone. Bye.